let me start off by setting the scene. It was the beginning of August, and my brother Drew and I were driving across a really remote stretch of central Iran with our guide, Mehdi. Our friends Rosie and Jane were following us in a separate car, along with Kevin and Lyndon, two 20-somethings from Ireland and Australia who'd joined us along the way. We'd been in the country for several days now, and as we continued heading east, we found ourselves amid a barren, desolate, and rocky terrain with small weeds dotting the landscape and mountains off in the distance. So hot and dry out here. It's much better than the other day. We were all dying by heat. The previous summer, there was a day when a city of 100,000 people in southwest Iran had reached an astonishing 165 degrees with the heat index. Thankfully, it was nowhere near that bad for us, but it was still pretty hot. Our little cars didn't have air conditioning, so we drove with the windows wide open and some wet towels around our necks in a mostly futile attempt to stay comfortable. We passed dry riverbeds, where Mehdi explained that former Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad had siphoned off water to cool his country's nuclear power plants. We also saw triangular camel crossing signs everywhere, though we didn't actually see any camels except for some tiny dots off on the horizon that may have just been shrubs. We weren't quite sure. So aside from camel meat, what are most camels used for? Just transporting goods? Camels actually, now there's a use for only diaries, things and stuff. Dairy? Yeah. Camel milk. Yeah. But not for carrying stuff nowadays. We drove along a two-lane road through a giant valley with a vast expanse of nothingness stretching about as far as our eyes could see in all directions. It reminded me of an image I once saw that one of NASA's rovers had sent back from the surface of Mars. The scenery was both jaw-droppingly beautiful and also kind of drab with almost everything a shade of tan or gray. We'd been traveling over an hour without seeing a single town of more than a few small buildings, so it wasn't the most interesting drive, but everything was perfectly fine until we rounded a corner and began climbing a hill. Our temperature gauge had been planted firmly in the middle during our entire trip so far, but now it was suddenly rising and getting dangerously close to the red. Quickly, we turned on the heater full blast, a counterintuitive trick someone had taught us to circulate air over the engine and cool it down. The indicator started dropping, but there was a hiss coming from the front of the car, so we pulled over to take a look. Wow, listen to that. So what What is is that actually? The spoiling. Uh, Our fluid's just going down there. Well, look, the water in the overflow tank is boiling. You see that? So what is that? Oh, it's shooting out the side. It's shooting out the side. Oh, there's a hole in it then. Oh, shoot. That means there's a hole in it. You see the water? There's a hole in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not good. At least we're not in the middle of the desert. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Scott Gurian. I'm a longtime public radio and print reporter, and I've always loved traveling and experiencing different cultures, so I've created this podcast called Far From Home to document my adventures. To start off, I'm telling the story of this massive journey my brother and I took with our friends raising money for charity. We drove nearly 11,000 miles. 11,000? That's right, a quarter of the way around the earth, from London to Mongolia, through 18 countries, eight time zones, five mountain ranges, and a few deserts in a ridiculously tiny car. It's like the pebbly hillbillies. It's not for the faint of heart. It's the adventure, isn't it? It's just the thing of pushing yourself to the absolute limit because I think it's going to take us out of our comfort zone, but in a really good way. If you're just joining me, I suggest you first go back and listen to all the previous episodes in order to get up to speed and for all of this to make a bit more sense. From language barriers to car trouble, getting horribly lost to paying bribes to shady traffic cops, it's been quite an amazing experience, and over the coming episodes, I'll be bringing all of you along with me for the ride. There was a moment in our journey when we were driving through the city of Isfahan, and we passed a guy standing on the side of the road. He waved at us, then jokingly yelled in Farsi, What the hell kind of car is that? He should have brought a better car to Iran. Standing now on the side of the road in the middle of the desert with water spurting out of our radiator tank forming a puddle below our vehicle, we were starting to think maybe he was right. We smelled it burning and that was the coolant burning. We smelled it pretty quickly and then we pulled over 20 seconds later. We could be miles away from civilization so it could be worse. (laughs) If you've listened to previous episodes, you'll recall that our car problems first started back in Europe. 
when we noticed we were going through water faster than we should have. So suspecting a leak, we got our radiator overflow tank resealed during a stopover in Bulgaria. When that didn't seem to work, a mechanic in Turkey gave us an entirely new tank. For several days after that, our vehicle seemed to be running great, and we were cautiously optimistic that all our issues were finally behind us. But now we'd overheated, and the new tank appeared to have sprung a leak. As trucks zoomed past us, we all huddled around the engine trying to figure out what to do. Like I mentioned, Kevin and Lyndon, those two young guys from one of the other rally teams, were tagging along with us at this point. Lyndon had picked up a bit of car repair knowledge from his father, who was a mechanic back in Australia, and that knowledge was incredibly useful to us at this very moment, given our near complete lack of mechanical know-how. He sprang into action, adding more water to our radiator to replace everything that had boiled out, and then he asked us to start the car back up to check the temperature gauge. Just hold the revs up a little bit. Whoa, it's, it's bubbling out the top when you do that. That's good. That's good. I was waiting for the water pump to suck it through the radiator, so to make sure there's no air locks in the huh? engine. Right. Okay. Because yeah. if you have an air lock in the engine, it's just going to boil again. I'm glad someone here knows what they're doing. Oh, come on. I turned to Rosie. <laughs> we would be totally screwed if it was just us. Yeah, totally screwed. <laughs> My brother agreed. This is the thing for all of the stuff that we did prep-wise. It doesn't make a damn difference because we'd still be completely screwed if... Yeah. you guys weren't here honestly like we took a mechanics class yeah. right now we have no idea what's going on <laughs> i mean i only know a couple simple basics but i've had some old cars and that was one problem that i did have once we got the air out of our engine it was time to repair our leaky radiator tank jane was excited hey you know what this means what does this mean we get to use the gaffer tank <laughs> She meant the special repair tape we'd brought along for exactly this reason. You see, before we left, we'd packed our cars with all sorts of supplies, trying to plan for every scenario of something that could possibly go wrong. And now our diligence seemed to be paying off. So we're going to try to take the whole thing out and patch it? You're going to have to. Yeah. Unless you've got a hole in the bottom, there's no worse place to have it. My brother helped Lyndon untie the piece of rubber the mechanics in Turkey had used to secure the tank in place under our hood. What is that, a black chip? Yeah, exactly. It's an inner tube, <laughs> yeah. It's it's Turkish really ingenuity. Tough. They're really good for concerts. Concerts? Yeah, you cut the valve out, tape one end to your willy, and you hang the bike tube down the inside of your pants. <laughs> what? So when you're, not, when you're not having a piss, you fold it over and tuck it in your sock. Well, it's, it's a homemade catheter. Do you know, I was just listen and learn. You know how long <laughs> it takes to get to the good spot in the mosh pit? <laughs> yeah, she no, I don't know how I survived the first 50 years of my life without knowing you. <laughs> Once they removed the tank, they inspected the hole. So where exactly? Yeah, it's a slit right there. It cracked. Oh, a cracked from the heat, I guess. The boiling water had also left stress fractures on other parts of the plastic. So after wiping the tank clean, we decided as an added precaution to wrap the entire thing with that special uh, tape we brought. At least twice its length to ensure the best fusion and tightest seal for high pressure leak stretch to the maximum amount. Wow. Rescue wow. tape works on either side. The tighter rescue tape is wrapped, the quicker and stronger it fuses. Pretty cool. This stuff is intense. Where did you find this? Um, uh, Amazon. But did someone recommend it? Yeah, I think one of the other teams. Wow, stuff is cool. Someone recommended that. So, start at the bottom, I guess? Sure. Stretch it. Stretch it. Just flatten it out. Somebody help to push it so it doesn't bubble in the middle. See what oh, I, mean? I see what you mean. Yeah, I see what you mean. We rotated the tank while my brother covered it with several layers of thick black tape. Okay, we've now sealed our radiator tank and uh, we're going to put it back in and hope for the best. We drove about 10 miles up the road, then stopped at a gas station and popped our hood just to make sure everything looked okay. And boy, were we glad we did. Look at it. Look at the tank. Oh my goodness. I guess maybe maybe it like it was too strong and it... Well, when it got hot, it just squeezed it. Fused together. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, that fancy tape we'd used had worked too well, putting so much pressure on the tank's rigid plastic, which was already compromised by the heat, that it caused it to collapse in on itself. So now it was about half its previous size, and once again, all the water had drained away. 
With our tank rendered unusable, we debated our options for coming up with a suitable replacement, like using an old water bottle or perhaps finding something in the gas station's convenience store. So do we literally at this point go and buy as thick of a bottle as we can find inside? I, would, I think we should maybe just, just go back to the old one? tank. You see, when the guys in Turkey gave us a new radiator tank, they also left our original one there, just in case we needed to return to it for some reason. Rather than try to fashion something out of something else, I mean, we already have another tank here. He left everything right here in case we needed to reattach the old tank. This is the tube so, for it. We just need to the undo these two bolts, move the battery to the side, and unfasten this, and then tape it up and put it back in. Yeah. Okay. So. The problem, of course, was that the whole reason we gave up on this tank in the first place was because we kept losing water, even though we were never able to find a leak. So reconnecting it would likely just put us back where we started. But for the time being, that seemed like our best option. Rosie and Jane saw that all this was going to take us a little while to repair, so they asked Medley for directions and went on ahead, figuring we'd catch up with them later on. Meanwhile, with temperatures over 100 degrees, our problems continued even after we switched back to the old tank, as our engine overheated twice more farther down the road. So for the time being, I guess we fill the tank back. We just drive with the heater on full blast to keep it cool so it doesn't boil as fast. I mean, yeah, it'll be helping with cooling. So yeah. Yeah. Of course, heat isn't exactly something you want more of when you're in the middle of the desert, but we didn't really have a choice. It was almost 6 in the evening by the time we managed to fix all our car issues. How many miles do we have to get today? It's still a number of hours. Like another four and a half hours or something. We've only done like 120 miles. Today. We've been stopping a lot. Yeah. But with Lyndon and Kevin's help, we were finally ready to hit the road again. Provided we actually get there, we're buying you two a very nice dinner. The best that this small town has to offer. <laughs> Perhaps a whole camel. <laughs> We didn't get to our hotel in Gonabad until well after dark. What time is it? It's about 11.15. How are you feeling? Exhausted? Of course. It's yeah. been a crazy day, yeah. to say the least. Yeah. We'd expected to find Rosie and Jane waiting for us when we arrived, so we were surprised and a bit concerned when we discovered they weren't there yet. We left a good bit after them, and then we stopped another time or two. Yeah you'd assume if they got to wherever they were potentially staying that they would do their best to get in touch somehow. I can't imagine they would stay somewhere else. Well, if they're not here, I'm sure they're not still driving. You don't think so? No. If we passed they, them, we would have seen no, them. but they could have gotten horribly lost. I can't imagine they would go stay huh? somewhere else. Yeah, I would be very surprised. I would too, but I can't imagine them still driving right now. Although Jane would keep driving right now. That's why Jane bought like four energy drinks before. Yeah. <laughs> When our friends set off earlier that afternoon, Medhi told them it was pretty much a straight road the entire trip. So he just gave them rough directions consisting of the final address they were heading to and a list of cities they'd passed through along the way. But as we made the journey ourselves, we realized it wasn't that easy. Many of the road signs were only in Farsi, and the route involved a bunch of turns that we never would have known if we weren't with a guide. What's more, Rosie and Jane didn't have working GPS or even working cell phones, so there was no easy way for them to reach us if something went wrong. We sat around the dimly lit hotel lobby, unsure of what to do. Damn, where could they be, my brother muttered under his breath. The night clerk was on duty behind the counter, and there was some sort of game show on television with a singing puppet. This is a kind of sketchy hotel, I said. Totally sketchy. (laughs) Speak of the devil. There goes the bug light again. We connected to the hotel's Wi-Fi and checked our email and WhatsApp accounts for the remote possibility that Rosie or Jane had sent us some sort of message, but there was nothing to be found. After waiting for about an hour, Medhi called his tour company to let them know what was happening. And then, left with no other options, he called the cops. A police car pulled up around midnight and was about to take a report when we finally caught sight of Rosie and Jane driving up the block. Yeah. They're here. He's standing up front. Hey. Hello. 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 We're here. We made it. 
We got worried about you. Oh, we were worried about us. It was not a bloody straight road, Rosie grumbled, speculating road, yeah. that they must have taken some wrong turns that added time to their journey. Well, I have to be honest, it did go through our head. We said, you know, if something happens to us, we are so stuffed. Yeah, in retrospect, that was kind of a spectacularly bad decision. It, yeah, yeah. On top of everything else was the fact that Rosie and Jane were both traveling with their British passports, and Brits, like Americans, aren't technically allowed to wander around Iran on their own. Our anxiety was, you know, the customs people and police, because we thought, well, if the police realize that we're British and we're not with our guide, that's got the potential for problems. So we told them we were Australian and that that was fine. Anyway, we're here. That was the important thing. Yeah. And our boys are here. That's the important thing, too. <laughs> well, it's been an exciting day. When I first heard that American, British, and Canadian travelers had to hire a tour guide in order to visit Iran, I was afraid we'd get stuck with a government minder who'd watch over us like a hawk wherever we went. But that's thankfully not at all how it turned out. In practice, we actually got several opportunities to roam around on our own, and having Medley there to help us translate added a level of comfort, since we had someone we knew and trusted to not just make sure we followed all the local rules and customs, but also, on a more basic level, to explain how things work in Iran. And let me tell you, there was a lot to learn. As my brother remarked while we were driving one day, we didn't know much at all about the country when we first showed up at the border. I think most Americans, when they think of Iran, honestly, they probably think of three things, desert, oil, and military. Yeah. They yeah. would think of the desert with like hidden missile silos or something, honestly. <laughs> and I don't, I don't mean to be yeah, yeah, disrespectful, right, but it, yeah. desert, oil, and uh, yeah. camels. nuclear capabilities. <laughs> But we soon realized that the country was much more than that, as we had in-depth conversations about everything from the role of the Ayatollah to the impact of U.S. sanctions to Medley's childhood during the Iran-Iraq war. This was clearly a place where things aren't always so black and white. Like, sure, the government blocks parts of the internet, but nearly everyone knows how to get around it to visit their favorite websites or watch their favorite TV shows from the West. And yeah, all adult women have to wear headscarves, but they've rebelled by showing their beauty through plastic surgery in such large numbers that nose jobs are now more popular in Iran than anywhere else in the world. Everywhere we turned, we saw this nuance and tension between sticking to the old way of doing things and forging a new path. But although Iran is moving towards being a freer and more open society, it remains bound by its traditional Islamic roots with religious and political hardliners still firmly in charge. We were reminded of this just before we left on our trip, when Iran's National Soccer Federation suspended one of its star players after a photo surfaced of him wearing bright yellow SpongeBob SquarePants trousers, which the Federation's morality committee deemed inappropriate, believe it or not. It was these sorts of conservative and occasionally anti-Western sentiments that caused Medley to warn us in some isolated instances that we might actually be better off not identifying ourselves as Americans or Brits. Yeah, they, they consider that you are coming here for spying, you know, things like that. So there would be more attention and things like that. Just, he suggested we instead tell them something else. It's Canadians. Canadians. But I'm not Canadian, Kevin protested. I'm Irish. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say I'm Irish. <laughs> yeah, you are. But for them, actually, all the Irish, you know, south and north or even Scotland, they're all considered as England. Oh, that's <laughs> not. I know well, a lot of Irish. But the that. image of them is like that. You know? <laughs> this is what I'm saying. This happened twice on our journey, in the religious city of Qom and at Mashhad's Imam Reza Shrine, a mosque complex that's considered the holiest site in all of Iran. Visiting places like these that are important to observant Muslims also meant that women like Rosie and Jane had to cover up even more than they normally would. So instead of just headscarves, they had to wear shadors, which are these big gowns that left their faces exposed, but otherwise covered their entire upper bodies. And the religious folks were really strict about enforcing these rules. 
We were just approaching the shrine and had barely gotten to the entrance where Rosie and Jane were going to rent their shadors when a woman came up and started talking to Mehdi rapidly in Farsi. She started pulling Rosie's headscarf down to conceal the bit of blonde hair that was peeking out, and she wanted to make sure Rosie and Jane knew they had to change clothing to go past the gates. Mehdi explained that we knew the rules, and he asked her to leave Rosie alone, and eventually she went away. Rosie was a bit pissed off, but she forgave the woman a few minutes later. She came back and she gave me a sweet. She knew she was in the wrong. <laughs> also standing near the entrance were shrine volunteers serving as moral police. They watched closely for anyone violating the dress code, and they had these feather dusters they used to tap anyone they saw committing an infraction. It was so strange and over the top that Kevin and Rosie couldn't resist poking a bit of fun at it. <laughs> She said she wanted to see what reaction we'd get if a man gave a woman a Frenchie. Like, and he said, are you up for it? I said, yeah, but then he backed off. I'm like, oh, well, okay then. While I agreed that the whole concept of moral police seemed a bit ridiculous, I also felt conflicted. Uh, well, I mean, on the one hand, you want to be respectful of their... I'm being you, deeply respectful. No, I know, but it's, it's but hard. But when you get hit over the head by a blue feather duster, it's hard yeah. to be respectful. <laughs> Seriously. No, no. My brother agreed with her. You want to respect your culture, you want to respect your religion, but when you fundamentally disagree with how people are treated, I don't see where that balance is. It's just wrong. Drew was fascinated by the spectacle of it all, though. He said he could stay there for hours watching things unfold, but we did come to see the shrine after all, so we continued heading towards the entrance. Now, most of the local women who came there brought their own shadors, which were black or other solid colors that wouldn't really attract much attention but not so for the ones the shrine rented to our friends. We spotted Rosie and Jane as they emerged from the changing area. There they are, right here, in the white. Oh my God, yeah. Those are some nice bed sheets, Lyndon joked, and I had to agree. The patterned fabric looked like it came from a cheap motel room. It's like a religious onesie, kind of. Okay. How come everyone else's is black and theirs is... Uh, because, you know, if we could possibly line. make yeah, Rosie and Jane stand out, right. let's do it. <laughs> is that super hot? Uh, it's super bloody irritating. It's, it's nylon. nylon. It's, it's nylon. nylon? It's nylon. Yeah. You know. Welcome to our country. Let me cover you in nylon, <laughs> she choked. It's 35 degrees. It's 35 degrees, it's they said. It's 35 degrees today. Which is but, like 100 but, but degrees say, Fahrenheit. But they almost. say it feels 40 because of With the, the heat uh, index. Heat, yeah. Yeah. Wow. According to the temperature. Inside here, I know. it's like 60. Yeah. That would be 140 degrees Fahrenheit. But for Rosie, it was more than just physical discomfort. I'm actually trying to work out how I feel about it because, you know, this isn't my religion. This isn't my country and I don't want to impose myself in a bad way here but no I don't feel comfortable if I'm being honest yeah psychologically I don't think of myself as a feminist but the woman who believes very strongly in treating people as equals is struggling with this at the moment because you know the guys are all standing around in whatever they want to wear I mean in a church in England in little England Men go to church dressed with more respect than here. You know, they've got a shirt and a tie on and a jacket and that sort of thing. Right. Um, and it just seems to be so unbelievably one-sided, you know, that the women have to cover themselves up, take their lipstick off. And the men don't even and have men, to dress up. No. Well, they do make the men wear long pants. They yeah, can't wear shorts. I, that's but true. But that's, it's, just, you know, it, it's just bugging me a little bit at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I'm surprised by it because when people were saying when you were coming, oh, you'll have to cover, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, well, that's fine. I'm in their country. Respect their rules. Respect their whatever. But actually now you're doing it. It's a peculiar feeling. Very peculiar. But it didn't really bother Jane. That's their way, isn't it? So that doesn't worry me particularly. Yeah. It's what they believe in. And in a sense, you know, we're in their territory here. I asked what she thought of Rosie's take on this whole situation. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, we've not had equality for women that long. And things are changing here. I suppose this is the extreme that we're seeing here. Yeah, and, and this is extreme for Iran. This is nowhere yeah, near Saudi absolutely. Arabia extreme. I mean, it is, there is such a massive difference between men and women. But the fact that, you know, women, they drive, they can go to work, you know, the things are... More progressive than yeah, other countries. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. We went through security and entered a giant plaza the size of a football field where thousands of people were wandering around or sitting on carpets praying. 
I later read that with nearly 150 acres, this was actually one of the largest mosque complexes in the world. There were seven courtyards in all, and each was covered with beautiful tile work with decorative verses from the Quran. The shrine was the burial site of the eighth Shia imam, who was a descendant of the prophet Muhammad, and was poisoned to death by the king during a dispute some 1,300 years ago. Shia Muslims make pilgrimages here from around the world to pay their respects. We saw religious guys with black robes and white turbans, long gray beards, and wooden staffs who looked like they had just arrived in a time machine from ancient Israel. There were families with children and people with wheelchairs and crutches. An awful lot of disabled people. They obviously come here as, a, you know, like lords. To be healed. Yeah. yeah. The prayer rooms were extravagant with onyx floors, giant chandeliers, and high vaulted ceilings covered with glittery, reflective shards of mirrors. We were all impressed, but as we walked around, my fellow travelers also poked fun at our surroundings. The bins where people left their shoes before going to pray were just like you'd see at a bowling alley, they laughed. And the main courtyard would make an excellent venue for rock concerts. It's not that I didn't have a sense of humor, but as I confided to Rosie, all this talk made me a bit uneasy. I feel very torn here, like... I very much want to kind of respect the traditions yeah, and, you I know, know. Yeah. I feel uncomfortable when people are making jokes about turning us into a concert venue or so, you know. Yeah. But I, think, I, I think it's partly our embarrassment. I think it's our discomfort. Yeah. It's making us be a bit silly, maybe. Yeah. I remember, I, did I tell you I went to Fatima, which is in Portugal, which uh-huh. is like Lourdes in France. Right, right. And somebody was supposed to, some children or something, was supposed to have seen the Virgin Mary and right. it became a shrine. And like here people come to be healed and there's a long narrow sort of pathway leading up to the main shrine where people crawl on their hands and knees showing humility and I went there many years ago and and it was a similar sort of thing I felt so uncomfortable because I felt like I was a choir watching somebody else's devotion when I just don't share it at all that was pretty much how I felt as we entered the gold domed room at the center of the complex where the imam was entombed Fervent believers packed shoulder to shoulder shrieked and tears streamed down their faces as they tried desperately to reach the mausoleum in the middle of the room so they could simply touch its gilded bars. Some people threw shirts and other articles of clothing onto its roof. The atmosphere was passionate and intense. It was a really emotional experience unlike anything I'd ever experienced. This is crazy, my brother agreed. People are like pushing as hard as they can to get near the front. Anything they can do to... The The crowd pushed so hard that it seemed like at any moment someone could easily fall and get trampled. Meanwhile, a line of men stood in the back, silently reading from their prayer books while they watched the madness unfold in front of them. We were only in the room for about three minutes, but that was more than enough. Let's get out of here. Back on the outside, Rosie said she also found the experience overwhelming. It was just so intense, and they were pushing and shoving and clawing to get to it. I stood right back because I thought I just, I actually... What's the point? Well, what's the point? And also, given that I am somebody who suffers from claustrophobia, that was my idea of a nightmare. Kevin and Lyndon boasted that they had managed to get to the front of the crowd to touch the mausoleum's bars, but once again, my feelings were complicated. So I felt really weird in there because I have a profound respect for people's beliefs and you could see how fervent the people were, you know, trying to get up towards the front and touch things and I don't understand it, you know, it's very different than where I'm coming from, Um, but I don't know, I felt weird and kind of voyeuristic like all of us who aren't Muslim and trying to like get up to the front to touch it like it's some kind of game or something, like to these people it's not a game, they've made pilgrimages from who knows how far away to be there. As we were leaving, I asked Mehdi for his take on all this. So what is that like for you? I mean, you grew up as a Muslim, yeah. but then you left at a certain point, right? Yeah, somehow I don't practice. I don't believe in actually, it's just you know, too much pressure. But your whole family is still Muslim? Uh, my family is still Muslim. Right. Um, we were all practicing actually when I was a kid. But later on, I studied more about religions and noticed you know, they're all similar. Islam was too rigid for his tastes, he said, and he hated how everyone wanted him to conform. Now that he has an outsider's perspective, Mehdi thinks the super-religious folks, including the moral police, are just kind of silly. When I'm saying these moral police and then people just follow them, 
Yeah. I'm really feeling sorry for my people. They don't think about it. He said some of his friends balk when he tells them he shakes hands when introducing himself to women in his tour groups, since that sort of thing is frowned upon in conservative Iran. And they're convinced he just gave up religion because he was influenced by all the secular foreign tourists he's met in the course of his work. But in reality, he said he already had his mind made up. That's not surprising, considering that ever since he was young, Mehdi always forged his own path, standing up for what he felt was right. Like this story he told me one day as we were walking around. And I remember actually back to when I was at high school or university. The religious leaders who ran his school laid an American and an Israeli flag at the entrance, which all the students were supposed to step on each morning as a sign of disrespect as they came to class. One day, he was suspended after security cameras captured him jumping over instead of stepping on the flags. And I was caught, actually, why, why I did that? I told him, you know, I have friends from America. Back and forth, you know, it's just too much pressure. Whether it's stepping on foreign flags, burning them, or chanting death to America, Mehdi doesn't deny that sort of stuff does occasionally occur. But he said the folks who do that are idiots, and they're in the minority. The vast majority of educated Iranians like him would much prefer to have a good relationship with the U.S. and the West, he said. On our last day in Iran, as we drove towards the border to exit the country, he explained that the first step to improving relations was changing perceptions. Sometimes we hear in Iranian media that, you know, everybody just killing each other in the U.S. Like a student shoot at everybody in the classroom or that guy went to the club and killed everybody. This is U.S., so don't go there, you know. Iran is the safest place around the world. Meanwhile, many foreigners hear similarly scary things about Iran. Mehdi said he'll always remember an Italian couple who were part of a tour group he led back in 2008. And the last day we were discussing what the highlight was, where they enjoyed more, and these kind of things. And they told me at the first day of the trip, they couldn't just believe that, that Iran is a very safe country. They were really afraid of going out and see people or what was happening actually in Iran. And before we get out of the hotel to start a tour, they say goodbye to each other if they don't meet each other and they would see each other on the other side. Wow. That's right. While they were really curious about Iran, they were also so fearful that they thought there was a good chance they could die at any moment. Suffice to say, they soon realized they were perfectly safe, and by the end of their journey, they planned to return home to tell all their family and friends about how wonderful their experience was. That's a really good moment, actually, when you hear these kind of things and people are very really satisfied of the trip. So it works both ways. Tourists see that Iran isn't such a scary place after all, while foreign visitors help change Iranians' perceptions about the West. Mehdi represents a new generation of Iranians eager to relax the rules and engage more with the outside world. And he says the best way forward is by changing hearts and minds one person at a time. As always, I encourage you to visit farfromhomepodcast.org to see photos and videos my brother and I took of some of the places and experiences you heard in this episode, including pictures of our melted radiator tank and footage from the Imam Reza Shrine. While you're there, you could also sign up for my newsletter so I could let you know when new shows are being released, or you can follow Far From Home Podcast on Instagram or Facebook. Coming up next time, we cross into Turkmenistan and we constantly feel like we're being watched. We even found like in the chandelier of our apartment, there was like a microphone and had like a play record button. It was so bizarrely hidden that it was just really eerie for all of us when we were like in that hotel. You wouldn't be hearing the show without the generous technical help of my friends at the Public Radio Exchange, so a special thanks goes out to them, as always. If you're looking for more interesting stuff to listen to, definitely check them out at prx.org. And speaking of listening suggestions, remember that if you're on the search for other great podcasts, you should take a look at the giant list I've compiled and posted on my website of some of my favorites. It's at farfromhomepodcast.org slash recommendations. Finally, if you have a moment, please do me a big favor and go to iTunes to give a rating or write a quick review of this podcast to help other people find it. 
It'll just take a few seconds, but it makes a really big difference. Okay, enough from me. Till next time, thanks for listening.